Hi everyone. Now we look at the case where we've got two constraints. So the idea is we want to optimize our function f, but subject to the constraint that the inputs have to live on the surface, g of x, y, z equals 0, but they also need to live on this surface, h of x, y, z equals 0. So they need to live on the intersection of these two surfaces, which is essentially a curve. So we're trying to optimize f subject to the constraint that our inputs live on a curve, the intersection of these two surfaces. How do we do that? Well, with the single constraint problem, we looked for points where the gradient of f was a multiple of the gradient of our constraint. Another way to say that is the gradient of f had to be in the space spanned by the gradient of our constraint. When we have two constraints, we do the same thing. Look for the points where the gradient of f is in the space spanned by the gradients of the two constraints. So gra gradient of f must be a linear combination of the gradients of g and the gradient of h. Why is that the case? Let's just uh, look briefly as to why this would be the generalization. So let's suppose f has a max min at x naught, y naught, z naught. And that point is on these two constraints, so subject to the constraints. And I'll just call these constraints for, for simplicity. I'll just call them g and h. Really, they're g of x, y, z equal to 0 and h of x, y, z equal to 0. So I'm supposing f has been restricted to these two constraints, and it has a maximum or minimum value at x naught, y naught, z naught. What does that mean? Well, let's let C be the curve of intersection of these constraints. So it's the curve of intersection of the constraints. So in our picture to the left, we've got our two constraints there. One is the pink surface, the other is the blue surface, and our curve C is that light blue curve of intersection. What's the relationship between C and F? Well, F has to have a max or a min at this point x0, y0, z0. So let's focus on the level surface of F that contains that point x0, y0, z0. That level surface, how is C going to be related to it? How does C interact with it? Well, the curve C can't cross right through that level surface because if it had points on one side of the level surface of f, then those function values on those points on the curve would be lower than the function value at x0, y0, z0. But then there'd be points on the curve that are on the other side of the level surface, and those would have to be higher because they're on the opposite side of the level surface. So I'd have function values that are higher. So that point x0, y0, z0 could not be a local max or a local min of our function f on the curve c. So what has to happen is C can't rip through the level surface. It's got to come up to it, touch the level surface, and then move back away from it. So our curve C has to get tangent to the level surface. So what that means is if the curve C is tangent to the level surface of F, it means that the gradient of F, or the normal to that level surface, is perpendicular to C at x0, y0 z naught. Okay, but the curve C lives on both surfaces, one given by G and one given by H, and so the normals to those surfaces, which are their gradients, have to be perpendicular to C. So C has to be perpendicular to both grad G and grad H. So grad G and grad H are perpendicular to C at x0, y0, z0. Now, we are in three-dimensional space. We are at a point, x0, y0, z0, on our curve C. Grad G and grad H form two directions that are perpendicular to C, so they will span a plane of all perpendicular vectors to C in which grad F has to be one of those vectors. So therefore, grad f is in 
the plane containing grad G and grad H. And so it must be a linear combination of them. And that's what we've written up here. Grad F must be a linear combination of grad G and grad H. Okay, so that's our statement of Lagrange multipliers for two constraints. Here's how we actually put it into practice. So when we're using this method, how does it change from our single constraint? Well, there's a second constraint. And then our gradient equations we need to solve just have this extra term in them involving the other scalar, which is mu in this case. So those are the only updates. Let's see how we can do this for a particular example. So here we've got a plane intersecting an elliptic paraboloid, and we want to find the highest and lowest points on their curve of intersection, which is an ellipse. So what is the function we're trying to optimize? The function is, well, we want to find the highest and lowest points. So the function would be, for a given point, we're interested in its z value because we want to find the maximum z value and the minimum z value. So that's the function we're trying to optimize. What is our constraint? Well, we've got two of them. We've got 4x plus 9y plus z equal to 0. We'll call this g of x, y, z. And we have another constraint, which we've got 2x squared plus 3y squared minus z is equal to 0. And we'll call this h of x, y, z. The method of Lagrange multiplier says we need to solve the gradient of f is equal to lambda times the gradient of g plus mu times the gradient of h. So let's set up those equations. We've got f sub x has to be lambda g sub x plus mu h sub x. f sub y has to be lambda g sub y plus mu h sub y. And f sub z has to be lambda g sub z plus mu h sub z. So now we compute all these partial derivatives. f sub x is 0. g sub x is 4, so that's 4 lambda. h sub x is 4x, so that's 4 mu x. f sub y is 0. g sub y is 9, so that's 9 lambda. h sub y is 6y, so that would be 6 mu y f sub z, that's 1, g sub z is 1, and mu sub z is negative 1. So it's 1 equals lambda minus mu. Now we need to solve these three equations plus the original two constraint equations for x, y, z, lambda, and mu. Five equations, five unknowns. I'm going to take this first equation from the x partials and rewrite it as well, negative lambda, I can bring the negative 4 lambda to the other side as negative 4 lambda, then divide by 4 mu. So I get negative lambda over mu is equal to x. I can do the same thing for the uh, y partial derivative of the equation. I can bring the 9 lambda over as a negative 9 lambda, divide by 6 mu. That gives me negative 3 halves lambda over mu, and that's equal to y. And then I can take this equation which tells me x is negative lambda over mu and plug it into this one. So that gives me 3 halves x is equal to y. And so I've got a relationship between x and y. Now I want to come up with a relationship between z and x, because now I know y is, can be written in terms of x. Can z be written in terms of x? Absolutely, because I have this relationship that tells me x, y, and z are all related in this linear way due to that first constraint. So by constraint, we'll call this the constraint g, and this equation star, which we just worked out, we get the following. That 4x plus 9y, so that's 9, y is 3 halves x, plus z is equal to 0, 
or in other words, 4x plus 27 over 2, so that's 8 over 2 plus 27 over 2, or 35 over 2x plus z is equal to 0, so that means that z is equal to negative 35 over 2x. So there's the relationship we're interested in. I'll call that double star, because that's important to know. Now I have this second constraint, so we will call that by constraint h and equation star and double star, we get what? Well, the second constraint tells us how x, y, and z are all related to each other, but we know y is defined in terms of x, z is defined in terms of x, so I can plug those into that constraint and get an equation entirely in terms of x alone, and that gives me the x values for the points that I'm searching for. So I can plug star and double star into that constraint and I get 2x squared plus 3y squared, but y is 3 halves x all squared, minus, and rather than say minus z equals 0, I'm just going to say equal to, and then we've got our z, and that's negative 35 over 2x. So we've got this, 2x squared plus, and I've got a 9 over 4 times 3, a 27 over 4 plus a 2, so that's plus a 4, a uh, plus an 8 over 4, so 8 over 4 plus 27 over 4 is 35 over 4, so 35 over 4x squared is what that left-hand side becomes. And uh, now I can bring that other side over because it looks like I'm going to get a quadratic in x that I'm going to need to solve for. So up oh, plus 35 over 2x is equal to 0. I can divide through by 35. I can multiply through by 4. And I get x squared plus 2x is equal to 0. Or x times x plus 2 is equal to 0. Or x is equal to 0 or negative 2. So I've got two values for x, two values of x that satisfy the equations we're trying to solve. Those five equations we're trying to solve, x has to be either 0 or negative 2, and then we can get the other values as well, the y and z values. And so therefore our points are the points that we get for candidates for being the highest and the lowest points are given by x, y, z is equal to, I get the one for x equals zero, and I also get the one for x equals negative two. So let's work those values out. Star and double star are what I need, because x is zero, so star tells me that y is also zero, because it's three halves of zero, and z is negative 35 over two times x, so that's also zero, so that's one point. Our second point is x equals negative 2, y would then be negative 3, and z would then be 35. And so we've got our points. Those are our candidates for highest and lowest points, and we can read off from this that this one definitely is the lowest because its z value is 0, so this is our lowest point. And this point here has a z value of 35, so this is our highest point. And so we've solved the problem. So let's have a look at a visual for this. Here was our diagram that we had drawn in our notes to the, to the left. The idea is we are trying to find the highest and lowest points on this curve of intersection. That is the highest and lowest points on this curve in three-dimensional space. So we've got this curve. We wanted to find the highest and lowest points. We found two points, 0, 0, 0, which we can see is the lowest point here. And we also got that point negative 2, negative 3, and 35, which is that highest point that's shown here. One way you can sort of just check for yourself, did I get the highest point? You know, you can drag down and look on it. Then you look at this point and you're thinking, oh, it doesn't look like it's got a x value of, so x is our vertical axis here, negative values going up. 
like, oh, x doesn't look like it's negative 2. The problem is when we're looking at this is things that are closer to our eye look bigger than things that are further away. To get, a, to get rid of that, we can go to axis and camera and switch on orthographic projection. And when I switch that on, I'll go back and I'll drag it around. And now things that are closer to our eye aren't bigger. So I can now read off that our x value is negative 2, our y value is negative 3, and then when I drag it and look at it from the side angle, the z value is 35. So if you want to read this off by dragging these things around, then you need to have orthographic projection on because you don't want perspective to get in the way. It doesn't look as nice, of course, when you have this turned on. Things don't look as nice because if you even look down at the plane, um, it doesn't give us that depth, that feeling of depth. And so if I turn it off, then we get a feeling of depth. Things that are further away from our eye are closer together. Things that are closer to us are bigger. So that gives us a nice feeling of depth. But if you just want to read off values by dragging things around, you might want to turn that off to just to, to verify that the values are correct from what you computed. All right, so that's it for this example. Thanks for watching.